Good afternoon, everyone. This is Kathy Nickham, and I'm the Education Director for the DPC Education Center. And I'd like to welcome you to our July webinar on Is a Transplant Right for Me? All of your lines are muted and will be muted throughout the program. And I just want to remind you that you can type questions in the chat box at any point, and we'll answer as many of them as we can at the end of the program. Within a week, the webinar recording and the slides will be posted on our website. You are welcome to share the slides, share the presentation with others. Um, and we also encourage you to complete the brief feedback form at the end of the program. You'll be able to share your opinions as well as suggestions for additional topics and programs. We are starting right, as you may have noticed, right on the dot at 2 p.m. today, Eastern Time, because we have a robust lineup of speakers today. And we have a lot to cover, a lot of information, a lot of people to share their experiences, um, and some really great information. And I'm pleased to start today's program by introducing Nancy Scott, who's the president of the board for DPC's Education Center. Besides being a nurse and having received the transplant herself, Nancy personally knows each of the presenters and will introduce them at this time. Nancy? Thank you, Kathy. Are you able to hear me? Yes. Hello? OK. Um, first, um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Sydney Swanson. And may I also say that everybody will be speaking in the exact order that I'm introducing them. And I will introduce everybody at this time. Uh, Dr. Sydney Swanson plays a special part in my life. He assisted in my transplant in 2011, so it's been nine years. Uh, he's the chief and surgical director of the kidney transplant program at Christiana Care Hospital in Newark, Delaware. Pr prior to that, he was the chief of organ transplant service from 1994 to 2005 at Walter Reed. Mike Guffey. Mike is a transplanted patient since 2012. Mike is a big deal at UMB Bank in Kansas. And may I also say that Mike worked full time the entire time he was on dialysis and continued to do so at this time. Mike is also a board member with Dialysis Patient Citizens. Danny Eningwes. He hails from California, and Danny has had two transplants. He had one in 2000, and he had another one in 2010. Danny also continues to work, and I know that he also does translation from Spanish to English. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, I guess. Sorry, I've been working here. Um, John Swanson here from uh, sunny uh, Delaware. Um, just trying to help you to decide whether a transplant is right for you. Um, I believe for most people it is, but for not, not for all, and we'll talk about that. Uh, okay. The slides are going a little slow here. Sorry. I'll get it set up here pretty soon. There we go. Now we'll go. There we go. So uh, what are your treatment options once you've been told that you have end-stage renal disease? Well, I like to bring up kidney transplant first because it's preferred for those that are medically eligible. You've got different types of donors, living donors, or deceased donors. We'll talk more about that. Your goal should always be is not to get listed, but to, but to, uh, go, to go to your transplant center with your living donor. Having said that, if you can't find a living donor, deceased donor transplantation can be a, is a real lifesaver as well, and we thank all our donor families. Dialysis, again, I would say is a bridge to transplant for those who are medically eligible. But if let's say you're not, you have to make it as good as you can. And um, uh, I think that should be our goal for everyone. Uh, there's in center versus home, and those choices are all between you and your nephrologist. Um, and certainly, if you look at it overall, survival is better. Patient survival is better if you're transplanted than staying on dialysis. But it depends on various issues, and we'll talk about those. All right, so some people just are, are unfortunately, um, unwell. And the uh, idea that you have severe coronary disease that can't be fixed, um, you know, um, uh, we, the things that you may need uh, more than a kidney. Some people have need of a liver or, or, or other issues or a pancreas if you have diabetes. Um, there are some people with 
uh, irreversible essential organ failure. And I'm not talking about the organ of choice, but you know, uh, heart disease, uh, coronary uh, congestive heart failure, those type of things. A current malignancy is is a no-no because we immune suppress patients, and you don't want to presumably have a cancer flourish in the setting of immune suppression. That does not deny people who are treated, and, and we'll talk about that. An active infection is is also a, a concern. Um, one of the things that used to be was HIV was a, a situation where you were not it was not safe to do transplant, but that certainly has changed now. And those can be found in certain transplants can be found for HIV positive patients who have uh, HIV associated nephropathy, and they can be treated successfully and transplanted. But it's, it, it does take a special uh, situation and uh, certainly stability in that uh, disease. Um, and sometimes people have just a, a number of things. It's almost like the old eagle claws game when you played as a, with your kid and you'd reach up and down the bat until you got enough stuff to be safe. But some people just have too many issues that transplant really is unsafe. Age is relative. You can be, um, that depends on your center. Uh, the more benefits you get though is the younger you are. That's all, that's the fact. Some people have such significant blood vessel disease from their kidney failure, from their other underlying conditions, that it really becomes uh, very tenuous, you know, trying to support a transplant with good blood vessel, uh, good, you know, blood supply. So those are one of the things that might or might not be a problem. So we've had patients who have had severe blood vessel disease and actually got treated for that and then were able to get a successful transplant. So again, those are relative things. Um, one of the things that has to happen is you, you always want to make sure that you've got people around, the, around you that can support you. Whether you're on dialysis or not, it's always useful. But transplant is a, a major change in a person's life, and it's very helpful to have uh, support that way. Uh, morbid obesity is certainly a relative issue. Uh, patients of all types know we know benefit, but it certainly makes the, diff uh, the operation a little more interesting. Uh, and I would just say, and more difficult, and whatever makes it easier for your surgeon makes it easier for you. I would just say that. Um, we, again, patients with active illegal drug use, it's, it's an issue that a lot of these issues, things will, will affect your kidney and, it's, and your overall survival. So those are problems that have to be adjusted with. And so we have a team, you know, members to support you with those issues. I guess we already had that one situation. Oh, they, I guess they translated over. Uh, here's another one. Patients with cancer that have been treated. So we mentioned that earlier. So if a person has a, a small renal cell cancer uh, that is removed, um, back in the day when I started doing this 30 years ago, that was a five-year wait time. But now we know that that's essentially a cure. And so those patients are being transplanted immediately, depending on the diagnosis, the, the, the biopsy specimen and such. So those, just having a cancer itself doesn't mean you can't have a transplant. It may just mean that you have to wait. Um, I think as a healthcare provider, I have to go again with tobacco um, abuse. We, we do not tolerate it in our program because it, it absolutely affects kidneys. There is a, a nicotine or, or tobacco-related uh, nephritis. So it impacts your survival, impacts the kidney survival, and most centers require this to be uh, um, a no-no. Um, Untreated sleep apnea, uh, so that's kind of a, it's, you know, it's sort of a, uh, with the whole CPAP thing, that seems to be a, um, an epidemic in very much in our patients, can be seen centrally with diabetes and other issues, obesity, other factors, um, but it has an impact on both your heart and then ultimately on your kidney. So we've seen people see extreme benefit after getting their sleep apnea treated just from the standpoint of being ready for a transplant and improvement in their cardiac function, but it makes them more transplant ready. How can I, how do I know if I can get a transplant? Well, the interesting thing is, is that you don't need to be on dialysis to be considered, all right? So the most common thing probably is on dialysis, and that's either hemo or peritoneum. Peritoneal, and you're referred usually by nephrologist, whatever. But you can be referred if you're not yet on dialysis, but your kidney function is at or below 20%. So, you know, that's when we mentioned this thing called the creatinine clearance or the GFR, those kind of things. You can ask your doctor if you're, you know, that's based on age and gender and race and various things. You're, if your creatinine clearance is 20% or less, then you would, you know, be considered uh, safe for a transplant. So you would want to um, get referred to, because that early listing helps you get a transplant sooner. So chronic kidney disease stage four, late stage four to five is also an indication for being listed for a transplant. Uh, it also helps you when you're trying to get living donors lined up and that type of thing. So it's, it's a very important uh, uh, thing to know. 
Uh, who makes the referrals? Well, later in the phase, it's usually the nephrologist, but they also, this person may be, you know, realizing that your, your credit clearance is moving on, so they're going to talk to you about two things. They're going to talk to you about preparing for dialysis. They're also going to talk to you about preparing for transplant. And then your, from the other standpoint is sometimes it's your dialysis unit can make it, uh, make it happen. And the other thing you can do is knowing these things, knowing that you're being prepared for, for dialysis, that you might want to consider even self-referring. But it usually works better if your nephrologist is the primary referral because they can provide your medical information and also uh, that coordination between your nephrologist and your transplant team. So that's probably the best way to go, but a person can self-refer. So what's the evaluation about? Why do we do all this stuff? So you're going to meet a bunch of folks when you go to your transplant center. And probably the key one you'd think would be the transplant nephrologist or the transplant surgeon, but actually it's your transplant coordinator. And I think people online who've had a transplant, Nancy can attest to this, they're sort of your quarterback. That's the, 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 the navigator that helps you get through this morass of getting all these tests done and getting yourself on the list. All right? So the transplant coordinator is your key person, but you will see all these, patients, all these people uh, focusing on your care when you go to your evaluation. What kind of things do we need? Well, one of the number one causes of problems in our patients with kidney failure is actually cardiac reasons. So it's very important that we get good cardiac testing and that you do everything you can to make sure that your heart's in best, best function. So again, no smoking. Watch what you eat. Watch your cholesterol. Make sure your blood pressure is controlled. Do all those kind of things. They're all things you can do, but these are, these are things that, again, if we found something that had to be fixed, then that can be done, and then you can go on to save transplant. Um, but that's a very important thing. You get annual cardiac testing, definitely, when you're on the transplant list. Um, your blood work. We'll have to look at various things. We'll test you for various viruses and things that might be present or might not be present, and then dictates how we, we would manage your immune suppression after transplant. But for the most part, your, um, uh, all this is pretty standard. The other thing we do at that time is, we'll talk more about it, is do, to kind of find out some of your, your we have to find out about your immunologic history or what your, uh, your, what we call the tissue typing is about. So you have to be in the transplant world blood type compatible, but you also have to be compatible from what we call the HLA or tissue typing. And those are two different, two different areas. We get, we get radiology, we get chest x-rays, we get CT scans and stuff to make sure that everything is um, uh, where it needs to be or, it's, or, or bad things aren't there. Um, for women, I think this is, in men, but for the overall, I think the really the most important thing to remember is what thing you can do to help yourself be ready for good, healthful living anyway, but also from the standpoint of um, being ready for your transplant is when you're, you're, when you're going for your evaluation, you should, well, all we do is follow the recommendations of the American Cancer Society for uh, evaluation of the patient. So you know, mammogram for women over 40, I know that's controversial. You know, if you've got a strong family history in your family breast cancer, women definitely should be over 40. GYN and pap smears exactly however is recommended for your age group. Your primary care can direct you on those kind of things. Your gynecologist, whatever. Colonoscopy for everyone over 50, that's sort of the standard. Uh, and then dental clearance seems to be kind of a, you know, why would you have to worry about that? But dental infections can produce significant problems in the post-transplant phase. They also can cause problems for your, your kidney function in general. So. Um, best that you kind of keep these things up to date, and if it came to the point you needed a transplant, you're, you're, I can tell you your coordinator will be ecstatic when you can tell her, oh, I've already got my colonoscopy, already got my mammogram, already got my pap smear. Um, so this is the important thing. Um, you, to, be, to consider yourself listed, all this stuff has to be approved, and your transplant has to get you before they can get added to the list. It's, it's not like you go for your evaluation, and, oh, that's enough, then I'm done. No, you've got to complete the stuff to get yourself on. And the faster you get some of this stuff done, many programs, including ours, will help schedule things that are, that are transplant specific. But getting all these things done your, you know, on yourself and on your own motivation is the key and uh, gets you listed as soon as possible. Now, one thing that's changed over the past, since 2014, is that if you're already on dialysis, you're, you're technically your time has started. Now, you have to be approved and put on a list that it can actually be official, but right now it starts from dialysis time. So we've had patients, I had a young lady the other day had, had not decided on transplant. She had been on dialysis for 17 years, but she wanted her transplant, so we, we got her transplant done 
the last you know few, several months ago, and she's doing great. But that was just her choice. But that time on the list was was really dictated by her 17 years of of dialysis. So that will gain time. But having said that, people that do it preemptively, people that get on the list early as they can, even if they're not yet on dialysis, that's still a benefit. You shouldn't wait till the dialysis because of that, because you still gain gain your time if you are um, preemptively listed or listed before the, the time of dialysis. So remember that. It's always important to get yourself on a list somewhere. Average waiting times throughout the country, and in our area it's a, it's, it's a bit longer. Some areas are shorter, depending on where you're at, but it's up to five to ten years. It really depends on, on blood groups. So A's wait the least, AB's are variable because they can have any donor, B's wait a little bit longer, and O's wait the longest, unfortunately. So just uh, be prepared. Do you want to get yourself listed as soon as possible? So again, does an evaluation guarantee you a place on the waiting list? No. What, are, what at some point, what will happen is you will be notified by your transplant team, and you'll be listed on something called UNOS, which is the United Network for Organ Sharing List. They're the federal agency that helps to allocate organs in a fair and, and just manner. Um, each area around the country, there's about 55 of them. They're called organ procurement organizations. You may be you know some of them in our area. It's the southern Del all of Delaware, southern New Jersey, and eastern Pennsylvania is served by the Gift of Life. There are many Gift of Life around the country called by it, but at least in our area, it's called Gift of Life, and they're the people that help to allocate organs locally. Uh, one other thing you always have to remember is your current nephrologist will be extremely important throughout your care. So they'll be doing your dialysis, they'll be helping with hospital admissions, and after that. Uh, immediately afterwards, we, we sort of take over for a bit, but after about six months uh, to a year, then they start going back and you get managed by all everybody. So I noticed, if you notice on the bottom list there, it's by your transplant team, which helps to manage your kidney immune suppression, your current nephrologist who helps manage your blood pressure, and then there's again that quarterback person, your primary care physician. Don't forget them. You always want to be in touch with them. Keep going. Just a warning to everyone, the nephrologists are great internists, but they're not your primary care. Your primary care physician is, is that person who you should be following with all, for all your regular things that, that uh, are uh, uh, part of uh, good, healthful living. Um, why do we have a wait list? Why don't we just get everybody a transplant? Well, uh, there's a lot of people with kidney disease in the country, and uh, about 100,000 or so are waiting for a, a, a kidney, and it, the list keeps growing. So we say 17,000, probably about 20,000, if you will, overall kidney transplants are done each year. So you can imagine that the longer, you know, the more we wait, the, 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 there's a, certainly a, a, an issue with uh, donation. Um, probably many things to make that happen in our country, but it's, it's still, you know, only, you know, it, it doesn't happen to the frequency we need it to meet our needs. Um, but if you can bring a living donor to the table, that helps you immediately. So remember, your goal should be to get listed, but more importantly, your goal is to be finding a living donor if you need kidney replacement. So what happens when you're on the list? You always want to be what's called status one. So status one means that you're active on the list, you're gaining time, and you're getting phone calls. So these are the people that are really ready to be transplanted. Everything is done. Sometimes, well, you know, like say peritoneal dialysis or something like that, and you get peritonitis. Well, if we were to transplant a patient who's otherwise been otherwise active on the list and, and, and in good condition, and we were to transplant them in an infection standpoint, remember we said active infection can't get transplanted. So what happens is if people will be placed in what's called a status seven or they're inactive, they still gain time, all right, but they won't be called for offers until whatever their temporary issue is, is corrected, all right? So there are some things listed there. So maybe uh, you needed a heart stent, and everybody suggested waiting because this is a general anesthetic for transplantation. So these are temporary things that will make you not a candidate at that moment, but once they're corrected, you can get back to the status of one list. And this is a very fluid and, and fluid uh, situation, so realize that. So one of the things that happens, uh, sorry, this is our local thing here, and I shouldn't have said it. We, once a person is listed, how do we keep monitoring them for immune status? Well, one of the ways we can do that, uh, and is, this is directed by your transplant center, is that we get, you will have blood samples drawn. Now, if you're preemptive, you'll have to do this on your own. If you're on peritoneal dialysis, you'll have to get it arranged through your PD unit. If you're in hemo, it's done pretty routinely through the 
um, through the regular blood draws that are done on a monthly basis. And what that helps us to do is to monitor your immune response or your immune system. It gives us an immune history and tells us what kidney will be safe for you, or more importantly, what kidney won't be safe. So you'll be experiencing those, monthly blood samples. And the, the test is actually called panel reactive antibody or PRA. All this lingo will fall off your lips as soon as you get listed. And here it is. So these, how do you get these things? Why, why would I have, if I haven't had a, you know, why would I get exposed to somebody else's um, antigens or these, these HLA tissues or whatever we want to call them? Well, one of the things, three ways this can happen. So you can get it through a blood transfusion. So that's why it's important that we, we your transplant center knows about blood transfusions. They're, they're life-saving. You can't avoid them sometimes, but there are certain techniques we can use to help avoid them becoming more of an immune st stimulus to your, to your response. So those are all human antigens that we're exposed to, and they will be, from a, from a blood donor, may be very, very different than yours. It'd be not like getting a transplant, but could be. So we filter blood, we irradiate blood, those kind of things. If you're listed on a transplant, you want to make sure blood transfusions are handled specially and that you notify your transplant unit that that's the case. Prior transplants is another way that is the most important probably the most prominent, important way that that can happen. So it is to be exposed to antigens. So maybe a transplant failed from rejection or just failed and you developed some antibody to it. That's the most common cause of graft loss, we know. But one of the interesting thing is, as transplant has matured, one of the number one reasons for people coming to the list right now is a failed prior transplant. Think about these transplants having a half-life. They last a good long while, but not forever. So we can do whatever we can to manage these things, but transplant failure is now becoming one of those things that, that can produce both PRA for patients, but it's also a way of losing your graft or, or a cause, you know, cause of going back to dialysis. Um, so miscarriages or pregnancies. So a woman can be exposed to um, uh, these HLA antigens because of differences, obviously with potentially with her husband or, or other situations. So um, these are ways that we can develop these antibodies. The higher that number becomes, the harder it is to become a, get a transplant because you have to remember we talked about matching a safe immune response in you to each kidney that comes up. Um, we're looking at ways to improve the way that you know sensitized patients can get kidneys, but this is one thing that can be a problem. So again, you want to try to uh, understand these things, particularly blood transfusions. Make sure people know that you're on a transplant list. So what is this about? So if you are in, you know, we, again, I'm looking from our region because it's obviously very close. There's about 15 transplant centers in our area um, between the Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and, and, and we're the only one in Delaware. But Maryland is just on the road, and there's two programs there. So if you're in a, a, a region that is close to other places, you can double list, it's called, or list uh, you could list, you know, here at Christiana, or you, and you could list in a place uh, down in Maryland or up in northern New Jersey. Listing in the same organ procurement agency is or, or organ procurement organization is not very helpful because it would be for the same pool of kidneys, if you will. But if you're able to go across a state border or across a uh, OPO line, and it's reasonably convenient for you, that will help you to get a kidney sooner because you'll be offered more kidney options be between the two different lists. So, and then, but one disadvantage, of course, is that your care would have to be with that other program. But again, it does get you a kidney sooner. All right, what kind of donors we have? This is the true grip, no matter, uh, gift no matter where you're, you're, it comes from. But certainly, one of the ways is a living donor and this is a person who selected you, or maybe uh, we'll talk about maybe in other ways, or a deceased donor. So again, what do we have? So you can be uh, living related, which is between first degree family, so that could be your brother, sister, or your parents, that's living related. So a uh, living unrelated would be from your uncle, who is not, it, which is kind of right, but that would, per, you know, living related, per, uh, pertains only to first degree relatives. But, um, so living unrelated. And actually that's the fastest growing. And so one of the things that happens is spousal donation, um, donation among friends, those kind of things are absolutely um, becoming more and more common um, as 
we expand our, or as our immune suppression certainly gets better. Um, and really the only criterion right now that you'd have to say is that a person must be, who wants to be a living donor must be very healthy and they must be willing because there are multiple ways that even an incompatible blood type kidney could um, be given to you, given on your behalf. So we could go through a pair donor network. Let's see, I think I have that next. Well, I'll just go through this. So again, what is the advantage of a living donor? So if you get, you know, evaluated and proved to be a candidate and you got a, your, your living donor, like I say, you bring them with you and they get evaluated, you could have a transplant in three to six months. All right? So you don't have to wait time on the list. The longer you wait on the list, the, uh, in quote, sicker you get. All right? So the, that would certainly be a, a great benefit. We take the kidney from, usually, now there can be some differences as we do these paired donor networks, but we take the kidney from one room and we go to the next. Every kidney has to be cooled for a while, and that's what causes some of the uh, problems with immediate kidney function. However, this is on ice for such a minimal time, it's almost like not being on ice. Uh, it's a planned surgery. We know that everybody's healthy and we can do it when we need to. Uh, and certainly the outcomes are uh, long-term are better. Uh, so these are some of the things, again, if you have a living, you know, somebody who wants to be a living donor, um, if you have a center in mind or whatever, you could call them, see what their situation, again, requirements for American, our American College of, of Surgery, uh, of, of can, American Cancer Society, sorry, for, you know, just usual follow-up, uh, very healthful, healthy people. But the real key, I think, is that when somebody offers to you, we encourage our people to say, you're not the screener. You've been told that a living donor kidney is better for you. So, but your goal is to just say, thank you. Here, call these people. And usually transplant programs will have, uh, you know, a card or something that, they'll, that you can hand to them and they can call you. Going on Facebook, doing all these various things to help tell your story, not woes me, I have kidney failure, but what your story is about. What would you do with a kidney? How are you, you know, those kind of things are important. Um, because it inspires people to do the right thing. All right, again, we talked about blood type compatibility in transplant. Uh, I just had a situation today, I was talking to one of our patients, he said, oh, I put out a bumper sticker that my daughter made for me that said, I have O negative blood, help me, please. Well, the, the situation is I had to correct her and say, take out the negative because in transplant, only the, the O, A, B, and AB matter. The positive and the negative part, the RH factor, only matter in transplant, I mean in transfusions and in pregnancy. So if you're O, you're O. And that person can donate to anyone. That's the universal donor. AB, universal recipient. So here's what I'm talking about. So let's say somebody really wants to donate to you. They, they, they're, they're so inspired, but they come up and they're a different blood type. All right? And we can't do it. Or that HLA cross match. Remember, there's got to be blood, like, blood type compatible, but they also have to be tissue typing compatible. Let's say that doesn't work out. You can go into what's called a pair kidney donor exchange. And um, you can do that through um, uh, your team, and they will uh, uh, allow you to uh, uh, put your, you and your, pair, your donor would go into a list, okay? and there would be an exchange. And so we were a part of a, a situation where a young lady donated in New York uh, City to the list. She just wanted to help out. And it started a chain that went around the country twice. We were patient and donor, uh, recipient and donor number 16, I think, and about 35 people got a living donor kidney because of this exchange. So there are various ways to do that. Your program will probably, most programs can you know, uh, work with this. So even if your living donor is not blood type compatible, it's not a reason not to do the transplant because there will be ways to do it. Again, requirements for living donation are good health, willingness. If that doesn't work out for you, there's a number of issues that, we, that you know, wonderful deceased donor fan, uh, kidneys out there that will benefit you. Um, uh, we appreciate our donor families making this most difficult decision in the middle of the night and it helps a lot of people. Um, so these are some of the various situations that are, you can, the donors will have um, that we have to evaluate. It will be right for one patient or not a patient. These calls happen usually in the middle of the night. There are two types. One is a brain dead donor and one is a donation after cardiac 
deaf donor, those patients were actually the hardest allowed to stop. They have a few higher risks, but overall, they're about 20% of the donors that are available to you. They can have excellent long-term survival, too. A little bit of a difference afterwards, because these kidneys, uh, the maker didn't intend for them to be uh, uh, put on ice and shipped across the country, but it does happen, and fortunately, the miracle of transplant, we can put them into people and they work well. Those kidneys that are longer, or these donation after cardiac death kidneys, will have a little higher risk of needing some dialysis after transplant. That's a pretty standard thing, usually a, you know, a week to 10 days, and then the kidneys recover, all right? Um, we, uh, I'll, I'll skip on this one because things are changing on the idea of, you know, with the opioid situation, there's a number of concerns about, you know, risk of hepatitis B, C, or, or um, uh, HIV transmission with donors in, in that setting. Um, however, it's been proven with really good testing, uh, measuring virus particles, not your body's response, that these kidneys are very, very safe. And in fact, it's, they're so safe over the last seven years that the CDC, everybody knows about the CDC, right, because of COVID, the CDC is recommending that we really diminish that difference between the two because these kidneys are, are functioning so well. So that will maybe change for some of you here on the, might be on the list or considering a transplant. But these are excellent, uh, usually excellent kidney functions, just out of unfortunate poor choices by our, our donors. Uh, hepatitis C is becoming a very interesting thing. Is that, that would be another discussion. But it's getting to the point where hepatitis C is, a, is now a treatable disease. It's curable. And because of that, there are some moves now, and, and we are considering it ourselves, is that actually their programs and studies been, having been done that take hepatitis C positive kidneys and put it, give them to negative recipients realizing they'll get hepatitis C, but treating them so they get the beautiful new kidney with, despite the hepatitis C risk with cure. So, but getting them off dialysis is a great benefit. So there, there's all kinds of things that are becoming available in the disease owner transplant world as well. All right, this is, we don't, I guess we put quality, but we're, we're not exactly sure. So each donor, donor kidney has what we call a kidney donor profile index. It's measured um, by 10 factors that have been determined to be important in the survival of the kidney. Interesting thing is it's real data because it looks at the, these factors from, and the survivals from kidneys from one to two years ago. Or, you know, so it actually has meaning for it. I, um, so from the standpoint, you can see that the living donor there says it has a, what we call half-life. Half-life is how long do these kidneys last. I love, that's why I, it's really defined as how long they have fail. But I'm a three-quarters full person, so I actually believe it's the other way around. So you can just see that the, um, the, the KDPI score, the lower means the younger donor, the higher means the older, more mature donor. So if you look at that, you'll say, wow, that, those other ones, I don't want anything to do with that. But if you're a, a, an old man like me at 62, I would take that kidney and take the five to six years of dialysis, off dialysis. But remember, this is an average. So I could, it could last longer. And I would get myself reset for my next one if necessary, okay? It resets the cycle of dialysis. So this is good for select patients. If you're younger, you'll want that zero to 20%. And in fact, we want, we're so, we prize these kidneys so much that if you're, each, each recipient has a score, if you will, as well, and the healthiest of the people that we think are gonna last the longest to, to carry this kidney through, they are, we ac actually allocate these very special kidneys to either kids or to um, this, this group. So maybe a 30-year-old or a 35-year-old is trying to take care of his family and such. And, and you know, I, that person should be getting those kidneys because they're going to last long enough to take that kidney to its full, full potential. We'll get good kidneys for the rest of the folks as well, but this is, this is one of the ways that it's occurred. So if you're mature, look towards that end. You'll get a good result. If you're young, we'll hopefully get you this middle kidney, and the rest of us will do very well with the, with the better kidneys in the middle. So we just kind of put it like the car story, and I guess they, we're going based on color, same, sort of the same car. Don't want to make you know, to think, you know, you've got that new flashy red car up there, that that's going to will be the best. But from the standpoint of if you look at them, they're all cars, right? And they're all going to get you, sorry, they're all going to get you to work, all right? It just depends on how flashy you want to be or how long you want it to last, so, or how long you need it to last. So those are the, the things you want to keep in mind. I would, you know, if you're young, 
the older donor kidneys don't apply to you probably. If you're uh, mature, think about them. Don't just turn them away because you can get excellent survival and benefit from them. Again, here they are. Not quite ideal. If you know that they're going to, you'll, you'll get survival advantage if you take these kidneys. It says 40. It's probably a little bit older than that. But um, uh, it, it is by a separate, separate consent. So you'll want to you'll ask your, your, your transplant community or your transplant center will offer these things to you or make this discussion with you. And you can say, gee, you know, I, don't, I really think I want to wait. Having said that, if you consider these kidneys, your wait time will decrease. And again, there's diamonds in the rough. Um, so again, this is that donor where they don't quite, uh, they don't meet criteria for brain death. And it just, um, it's a kind of an interesting situation. 20% of the donors are this. Um, the donors removed from life support in the operating room, and then the kidneys are, are recovered once uh, death is declared. Interestingly enough, families are in the operating room with their loved ones during the time of demise. Um, and they have a greater risk of having that slower function that we described. All right, I'm going to pass this because I think it's going to be less of an issue. Um, how are organs offered? So we get a call in the, uh, uh, the middle of the night um, from UNOS to, to the Organ Procurement Organization, our gift of life. And then each kidney generates a new list for every, every kidney that's offered. And then they'll call us, and then we make sure that we notify you. And it's our policy that if you have any questions about a kidney, we try to work through that quarterback again, that transplant coordinator who knows you probably the best. But anytime you want to talk to us, we'll help you with that decision. Again, I think most programs vet kidneys very well before they make offers. So when it comes to you, think about the fact that a lot of people have looked at it before they made the offer. So you always have the choice. It's voluntary. You can turn down a kidney without penalty. And, but think about what's been happening prior to your, all these people looked at these kidneys and say, this is going to be pretty good. So when they call you, it's, it's with a purpose. Um, we have about an hour to reach everybody. Um, you want to make sure that you contact you. Everybody knows uh, who you are, what your numbers are, and how to get a hold of you. And if there's, if you got some spotty phone service, make sure somebody else around you can do the same thing. And most commonly, you're going to, if you get a call at two o'clock in the morning, it's going to be us with a kidney offer, not the IRS. Um, so one of the things that sort of has happened is this has sort of become a real roller coaster for our patients. Um, and you're going to see many offers. And the reason we do that is because, we, as I say when I'm talking about the transplant community, all these kidneys are on ice, right? And we want to get them off as ice as soon as possible. So what happens sometimes is you'll, we'll offer it to 10 people. This is the way our, our local list works. Four different centers, 10 different people are offered. And the reason we do this is so that, you know, let's say the first two people thought they were okay, but they came into their, and they weren't okay, or something happened, or they didn't want the kidney, they changed their mind once the anatomy was known. Then the next person can just step right in. So what will happen is you'll get many offers before you become truly what we call the primary. So just be prepared for that. Um, um, but it's, it's, it's worth it because every time we look at you, we compare you to a new donor, we know more and more information about your immunology. And once we know that, that helps you get the best kidney possible from that standpoint. So it's frustrating, but it's, uh, uh, it's worth it. So there's really nothing is sort of the top of the list. You can't really say that. The only thing I would say, you'll be able to read these, these comments, everything like that, sort of running short on time here. But the idea is that once you start getting phone calls, it's almost like being pregnant. Pack your bags, because that means that things are, are happening for you. So it really determines that kind of, you can always talk to your unit or your team and say, well, where do I stand? They'll give you some idea. But everything will kind of change a little bit. So make sure that you are always ready. But once you start getting phone calls, pack a bag. So one of the things that has to happen and it gets kind of frustrating sometimes is we've got this beautiful kidney. We want you to be, um, uh, we, we want to give it to you in the worst way. But then we do this thing called the cross match. So again, it may be compatible by blood type. But once we have compared it to some of those tests that you had while you were on dialysis or while you were waiting, we get back what's called a positive cross match, which means that that donor won't be safe for you because you'll reject it. So those things are frustrating but can happen. 
So that cross match, once we've called you and said, oh yeah, we want you to get this kidney, can't really do it until that cross match is complete, the cross match is negative. So just be prepared for that and you have to, uh, uh, again, frustrating, but, but it would give us more information to make the next kidney safer. Hey, this is what I like to do. Here's the kidney transplant operation. So uh, it's all I'm going to talk about from it. And so this is, you can see from that, the very colorful part is why the, the red is the artery, the blue is the vein, and the yellow is the ureter. And I tell patients that I, I'm like a plumber. I go red to red, blue to blue, and yellow to yellow. Uh, and one of the one of my uh, patients was an electrician. He said, "Hey, I do that the same thing, you know." So we figure we're we're trying to you know compare notes. But the idea is that if you can see that it's sewn into the blood vessels of the leg. You see where the incision is down there in the right or left lower quadrant. It really doesn't matter. So it's down in the blood vessels to the leg. So that's why those that evaluation for coronary disease and heart disease is is important. So this is uh, uh, how we sew it in. And interestingly enough, this is, uh, even though it's abdominal, the incision is abdominal, it's extra peritoneal. It's outside of the peritoneal cavity. So a lot of any complications or problems are, are limited. And because we don't really affect the bowel, recovery pre is pretty quick after a transplant surgery. You know, there are some things that can occur. Again, I want to get the other speakers in here. Um, most things that are, happen to a transplant are not catastrophic. Most things are nuisances, and you have to fix them, but that's the way it goes. So um, it doesn't happen often and can be corrected, but certainly we have to uh, always be mindful of what these things are. And that will happen. You'll have to have a discussion with your uh, surgeon about the situation, and, and they will, I know, fill you in. Um, usual these days are even some places are shorter. Where, where you know, it's you know three, four, five days for a living donor, four to six days for a deceased donor, depending on kidney function sometimes. So people are we're moving on out quickly because it's safer out there than it is in the hospital. And so our goal is always to get people out for as soon as possible. The thing that will be changed now, your trade-off from dialysis, all this better feeling and everything like that, your trade-off from dialysis will be taking anti-rejection medications for the rest of the life of your kidney. And hopefully that's a really long life. So uh, these are the things that happen. So a lot of things will change. If a person is um, hypertensive before transplant, 80% chance they'll need some medic medications after transplant. So diabetes will be more interesting to control. There are various things that occur. But just realize that you'll, you'll trade in that dialysis needle or that PD, PD fluid for a handful of pills. But your, your transplant center will help you make sure that those are uh, as easy to take as possible, work out regimens for you that are, are safe and tolerable. And uh, let's see. Oh, that's, that's our thing. So one of the things we always recommend to our patients, sorry, some of these slides are from what I present to our patients. Um, you'll be, in the short term, it's very frequent. Uh, you know, you'll see your transplant center five, six times in, in uh, 30 days. Uh, then it becomes less. And later on, again, importance of maintaining yourself with your primary care and your, your referring nephrologist is that they will start to manage your care, uh, this kind of medical issues, long term. We will always will be around to help with the immunologic issues, but long term, they're the experts in long term healthcare management and you want to count on them. We always encourage our people to thank the donor family. Obviously with a living donor it's easy, but with, a, with deceased donors, um, they don't need to know everything, but knowing that somebody out there has gotten a, the gift of life and wants to, um, uh, will take care of it for them is, is, is great solace to them in the, in the time of their loss. Um, and again, uh, moving or whatever, your transplant center, you're sort of wedded to them forever. Um, it's kind of a unique uh, process, one of the most unique that I've seen in my, my career, I guess, which has mainly been transplant, in the fact that you are you're ours, you're part of our transplant family until you're not. Okay, so here's some of the medications. There's a number of things. Um, again, these are all things that will be, uh, this is what you trade off. You'll be taking meds for blood pressure, cholesterol. Transplant doesn't treat your diabetes unless you get a pancreas. So those are the kind of things that you'll be, um, uh, help with your management best from your medical team. All right, so what are the risks? So one of the things that long-term that we can't really help is the fact that there are increased risks of certain cancers. And if you think about them, they're the ones that are 
um, mediated by a virus, and we're seeing more and more of those kind of things. So we are constantly in the monitoring for that. Skin cancer is probably the most important. If you are not yet on a transplant list or whatever, it, unfortunately, skin cancer comes from what we did when we were teenagers at the, the pool or the beach uh, or working in the fields. Uh, and so you want to make sure that, you know, always maintain good skin care. Block. If you're going to get a transplant, you'll want to make sure that you get a block, wear a hat, be, be careful out in the sun. Sometimes there's, there's some things that have developed in the kidneys that become a problem. You have to make sure that uh, the old kidneys, we will follow those closely and make sure that there's not a problem that develops there. Um, so it's related to kind of kidney disease and dialysis that people develop cysts in their kidneys that can become pre-malignant. Pre we, we always are monitoring for those. Um, and so, somewhere, again, most of the immune suppression is, real, is the viruses are virally mediated and immune suppression related, and we know how to monitor for those. Um, again, I'll bring out time here. But I think I, what I really want to focus on is you are the most important member of our team. You've got to be involved in your care. You've got to make sure that things are, you know, on the right track. Um, we, we can make recommendations. We can do things. But what's the most important is that you are, um, you are quarterbacking your team. You are the quarterback, not us. And now I guess what we'll do, and that, I guess we're going to answer, ask for uh, questions later. I hope I didn't run over too long here. I was trying to get it done. But here's Mike is going to give you some uh, experience that he's had with his transplant and, and something I can't give you. I've never had a transplant. I can only give you what I've, my patients have told me. But here's a guy that's going to give you some actual tips on what to do after your transplant. Mike, you ready? Sure. Thank you, Dr. Swanson. Um, my name is Mike Guffey. Um, as Nancy said in the introduction, um, I had a transplant eight years ago. Um, it was mine was a cadaveric transplant. Um, I had I had several issues with family. My parents were older. A lot of my relatives were older. Um, I'm also adopted, so I didn't have a blood type match with my family members. That sort of slowed some of the, the donations down. Um, I had a couple of friends who offered to donate kidneys to me. Um, one of them had an insurance situation that made it really unfeasible from his standpoint to do that, and I just didn't feel comfortable, I'll be honest. From a personal standpoint, and this is very much a personal decision, I didn't necessarily feel comfortable with um, asking somebody else for a kidney not knowing what would happen to them down the line. Um, I know there are some benefits if you're a kidney donor as far as where you go in the list if you ever need to have a kidney need of your own, but it's, it's a, a personal decision. Um, I worked full-time while I was on dialysis and for the transplant, um, so I had secondary uh, private insurance. That was a big help during, it was a big help in some ways during the transplant process. It also made some interesting issues during it. From the positive side, having secondary insurance was a good proof of uh, financial responsibility um, because the transplant team that I was dealing with when I got listed knew I had the finance and the insurance to back up, um, paying the additional expenses. Um, I mean, sort of the anecdote I always tell is that at the end of the, my transplant experience, the hospital stay, um, after the transplant, when I got home and got the bill, I got a $27 bill from the transplant center that, did my, that performed my transplant. And that was my share of the entire surgery, which was a, a, a wonderful feeling for me. Um, the drawback with the insurance is that, obviously, the private insurance called the shots on my transplant. Um, I ran into a couple of complications as I was working through the transplant process. Um, one of them was my insurance company and my dialysis provider, um, the organization provided my dialysis time, had a falling out. Um, the head of my, the administrator for my dialysis clinic was also my nephrologist, was also the head of the transplant program at the hospital where I was working to get listed for a transplant. Um, that caused issues with the original listing for the transplant. Um, they recommend I go to a different hospital locally um, to get listed. When I went there, the other hospital lost my paperwork, and it took three months for them to find my paperwork. I called every week to see what was going on. Um, they, had a, they had a very different organization than anybody else I'd seen in that they did not have an assigned coordinator for the transplant, uh, pre-transplant patients or post-transplants, um, and it didn't work out that way. Um, in the middle of that, as I was getting that resolved, um, my employer changed insurance companies. So I had to change the tactics. Um, 
the insurance company eliminate all the local transplant centers, and there were three in the Kansas City area where I am, from the listing of preferred providers and gave me two options, uh, one in Omaha, Nebraska, and one in St. Louis, Missouri, which is Barnes Jewish, who I had some knowledge of. Um, and I worked with, with Barnes Jewish to get listed. Um, again, it was a little bit of a challenge because my transplant center was three and a half hours away from where I live. Um, so it took some, some coordination. Um, one of the things I will say is if you're on the transplant list, you really need to take ownership. I mean, doc, the doctor said that, uh, but you really do. I had an, a, an issue as we were going through dialysis that I, my primary nephro nephrologist had put me on Sensipar. Um, the transplant center is a firm believer that you should not be on, on Sensipar prior to the transplant. It masks some issues they believe will, will emerge after transplant. Um, so they wanted me off the Sensipar. Um, it became a battle between my primary nephrologist and the head of the transplant program at Barnes Jewish. Um, neither of them was going to win. The real loser was me. I mean, I got involved in a conference call with the two of them and finally sort of said, hey, it's my kidney. You know, I want to do and I want to work a compromise out here. We need to do what you guys think I need to do. But, you know, I don't want to be off the list. I don't have other options. So we need to work something between you guys and work to a, you know, a conclusion that will satisfy both of you and keep me listed. Um, that worked. Um, the other nice thing from having private insurance, I'll say, is I did have a coordinator in addition to the transplant coordinator I had at Barnes Jewish was very helpful to me. Um, my insurance company, both of the insurance companies I dealt with, assigned me an insurance coordinator who was also very helpful in seeing um, me through and making sure my paperwork was in line, making sure I had appointments, making sure I was doing what needed to be done. Um, I got my first call for a transplant three months after I'd gotten listed. Um, they said the, the organ was a perfect match, but I was not the primary candidate because I had not served my served time on it. Um, but it was a wake-up call because I hadn't really considered having a transplant. They told me three years. At three months, I really hadn't considered, wow, this could happen any day now. But it was a pure wake-up call to me to get ready, get a go bag ready, make sure it was with me at all times, and be ready for that. Um, my second call came two days before Christmas. I went into the hospital, drove to drove to St. Louis, got checked in, got to the point where they said the next person you see will be a transplant nurse. They're going to come up and give you. Uh, they're going to have a have a cup in their hand with two pills you'll take to wipe out your immune system, and they'll then wheel you down to surgery. The next thing I saw about five minutes come through the door were two transplant doctors who I recognized from the program. And they told me that the uh, kidney was damaged when they were trying to retrieve it. Um, the kidney transplant could not take place. Um, and as they told me, you know, hang in there. And it was a great advice. It was hang in there. Your day will come. Um, two weeks later, I got a call from the transplant center on a Thursday night when I was leaving work saying, we'd like you to come over. We've got another possibility of transplant. You're the fourth person in line for it. So we're probably just going to have you go home in the morning, but we'd like to have you here um, just in case. I knew being three and a half hours away, I didn't always feel like I was directly connected to the transplant center. I couldn't just stop by to see my coordinator or anybody. Um, so I said, sure, I'll come over. I went over. Um, they told me I was now the third person. One of the people that was primary had not was having a fever, could not be transplanted. Um, when I went to bed that night, the night nurse said, um, we're going to get you up in the morning and send you home. And I told my boss, this is a long shot. You know, I'm going to be back Monday. I'm going to take Friday off as a vacation day. I'll be back Monday. Um, about 5 o'clock in the morning, the next morning, the night nurse got me up and said, I've got in my hand a cup with two pills that I need you to take. Um, you're scheduled to go over to, to the, uh, down to the transplant, down to the surgical unit. You're the first surgery of the morning, and you're getting a, a new kidney. And I was like, oh. Well, I probably need to do a couple calls, if you don't mind, before we go down. I need to call my boss and say, I'm not coming in Monday, obviously. And I need to call my mother, who's at a hotel, because um, she had to drive me over and say, you know, I'll be, I, I'm going to, for surgery, you might want to come over and not wait to have your coffee, have breakfast. But I don't, certainly don't want you to come over here and see an empty room and think something happened. Um, had the surgery. It was great. Um, I can't speak well, highly enough, and I'm sure it also is true from what I've heard with Dr. Swanson, but I can't speak highly enough about the treatment I got at Barnes Jewish. Um, I got to the recovery center 
um, the recovery room afterwards, after getting I got a quick visit to ICU and the reco ICU recovery, got to my recovery room, called my boss just to check in because I left a voicemail for her. Um, and she asked who I was. She said, your voice is totally different. You have energy. You sound like you have life. Um, and that was a start. I mean, it, was a, it was a new lease on life, and it's been eight years, and it's been going great since. Um, that's really my story. I would, again, say take charge, um, take, some, take ownership, and help see your way through. Um, and I'll turn it over now to um, Danny and Iguaz with a different, another story on transplants. Danny? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you're at in the uh, United States. Yeah, so at the age of 12, um, I was diagnosed with kidney transplant. I got an accident, by, uh, by, by, bicycle accident, and uh, went to the emergency room. They came back a couple minutes later. They told my mother, your son needs a, his kidneys are gone. He needs a transplant. He needs to be on dialysis, not knowing not knowing at all what Dallas was or what King does, it was news to me and my family. So right away they they put me in they contacted my mother saying, Let's test the parents. My mom my mother came out uh, uh positive for uh for a donation. Uh Kenny was awesome. So right away I didn't know about Dallas. Right away I got a kidney transplant. Uh this was December seventeenth, nineteen ninety two. I was twelve years old. Uh and so she gave me second chance to life. Uh, so that kidney lasted about 10 years. Uh, so, and then I re that kidney rejected in like 2000. So I went back on dialysis for 10 years, uh, waited 10 years for another kidney. When I got the phone call, your kidney's here, what do you want to do? And I'm in the middle, I'm in Fresno, right in the middle of California. San Francisco's a three hour drive. So I'm definitely going, uh, no question about it. Uh, knowing how transplants work, I'll take that kidney. So uh, I've been blessed with life twice, uh, uh, thanks to those who donated, of course. Uh, and I try to be very active in the kidney community because I feel we're speakers. We go through it. We understand what's needed uh, as patients as or family of patients. I think it's very important to be very vocal and to understand the situation. Um, and I try to stay positive. I work full time now as a medical interpreter. Uh, I guess growing up. I listened to all these medical terms when I was young, and I was like, you know what? This is enticing to me. I want to, I want to go to school and help out whatever I can. So obviously, I chose the medical field. So I've been doing that for uh, 12 years, uh, and uh, it just feels awesome. Um, the only advice I have for everyone is just be an advocate out there. Be an advocate for yourself and for others. Be a voice. Uh, be heard out there. Uh, I can't. I can't say how enough important it is to take care of your body and understand that dialysis does not mean the end of life. Remember that. There's always options. Take care of yourself and see what modality works for you, whether it be peritoneal, dialysis, or transplant. And just talk to your family, talk to your friends, and talk to yourself. Understand what works best for you. And with that, I'll leave it to the next speaker. Thank you so much, everyone. Hello. Hey, so I'm, uh, Joanne. I'm Joanne Smith, um, but I, I would like to offer Dr. Swanson, if, if, if that's okay with everybody, the opportunity to, to jump on and answer some questions. It's three o'clock. Uh, I'm happy to stay on later. I just don't want to hold him up. Um, so Hillary and Kathy, is that okay with you guys? And Dr. Swanson, is that good with you? I know there's a, a large number of attendees and I want everybody, if they have any questions, to be able to get them in. Uh, that works for me. Um, so there is a question that came in that was, uh, if someone's uh, kidney transplant uh, is failing, is there a time frame for when possible donors may start being assessed? Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Hello? Yep. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, good. So, uh, yeah, I saw this comment. I was going to answer it, but I, now that we're in, I was, um, yeah, so the same rules would apply. So if your if your center uh, um, uh, will have no, will know you right your 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 nephrologist whoever's following you um, if your creatinine clearance again drops below twenty that's the time that's a, the time to consider relisting even though that may not mean because you know a, a, a transplant with a single kidney it's not creatinines aren't exactly the same right 
as having two kidneys. So um, uh, there's actual a special CK, CKI writing for reading for transplant. But if your cramming clearance is 20 or less, you can get relisted for a new transplant. So don't make sure you don't forget that part. But at that point, really what you want to do, so remember we talked about half-life. So a kidney lasts a certain amount of time, even a living donor kidney. So the best thing to do is kind of get a, a feel for when, the way I practice is that I, if your cutting clearance was 19, but you still have one to two years left on the kidney, if we do, you know, control your blood pressure, control your diabetes, do all the right things, then we've taken one to two years off the half-life of your new transplant. So the idea would be to maintain you the best we can, but have, you know, get an idea that the donors are there. I would start assessing them, uh, getting them ready the same way you, as if you were a new patient um, to, to chronic kidney disease, at least have people in the background. So you could have, uh, you know, say your best friend wants to donate to you, but maybe not do it now, but make plans. Uh, we've had people who are school teachers who, uh, you know, always, school teachers always are giving, right? So instead of giving during school year, they give during the summer. And so maybe that's what they would do. Um, but from the standpoint of it, you would want to get your, uh, you could start lining up donors at, at that point. And, um, you know, they could get their, make sure that their medical health is good. Make sure that they follow up with their primary. Get your, you know, some uh, make sure that their blood pressure is well controlled, maybe lose some weight, maybe stop smoking, maybe do some other things that they could do in that interim period. But to, to transplant somebody right away would be sort of a, I think, a waste of some life of the old kidney. So you'd want to kind of wait that out a little bit. But getting patients, once you start, would be realistic, I would start talking to new people, new, new donors. Does that make sense? Yeah, and uh, the next question is, what is the ideal weight for a transplant, and is there a certain age for someone to donate? Okay, so uh, thank you. That's, uh, so I guess, Ms. Bishop. Um, so the ideal weight for a transplant recipient, I'm assuming you mean, is um, uh, it's, it's relative because BMI is certain things, but um, people, various cutoffs. But our cutoff is 38 uh, for active, um, so not... You know, super, super, but 38 for active listing, uh, 41 for evaluation. If a person comes in at a higher BMI, we do everything we can. We've referred some people to our uh, local uh, bariatric center, and that's worked out. We've done, we we have some places that we can send from the standpoint of improving weight loss. We have our transplant nephrolo our transplant dietitian that helps with that, or or coordinates with the dialysis. Uh, 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 dietitian, um, but it's, it's a matter of being safe. And sometimes what happens, people come in with a, a larger BMI and I have to fight with my nutritionist because I say, it doesn't really matter because it, everything is sort of distributed and I can get this kidney in safely. So we, we do have a little, we don't always agree on everything, but those are guidelines. For us, our program is 38 and 41 for listing, 38 for active transplant, but there's give and take. Um, what was the other question then? Age of donor. What was um, the other the question, question then, Wasn't there something else? certain age for somebody um, to donate. Yeah, right. so the age is, um, there is some thought that beyond 65, one does not get as significant a benefit from living donation. As we age, there's probably a one to two mil per minute decorate, uh, degrading of our kidney function over time. It's just the way it goes. And so at some point, we probably degrade enough where the, the kidney doesn't provide enough you know, for the for the donor or to maintain the recipient, or it would be you could get some kidney function, but maybe not enough. So the idea then is is you know, 65 may not be the right way to go. But there's so many factors that go into it, particularly like you know we've talked about spousal donation, where um, they're compatible in more ways than one. And so we go with uh, you know a, a mature couple. I'm 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 62, and my wife I won't say what she is, but close. All right, and she. You know, if I were to give her a kidney, that would be ideal. Again, it would sort of match that that higher KDPI, but she would get excellent function for enough period to get her, you know, back to, to normalcy. And so that kind of thing works out very well. But beyond 65, there's some question whether or not you get, again, life benefit, but you certainly would get um, dialysis benefit. So it's all relative, and the most important factors are good health and willingness. And once that you can make those two criteria, 
go look for a place that may, may accommodate you. The next question is, due to coronavirus, are centers willing to see patients post-transplant virtually? It is becoming the standard. And in fact, what happens is it expands our reach so dramatically. You know, it's unfortunately, if you're looking for green shoes from this tragedy, it's one of those. And the idea is that um, we are the only adult dentist, uh, transplant center in Delaware, and so we sort of have the Delmarva Peninsula, if everybody knows, gets out their map, uh, sort of our wheelhouse, and we have to take care of these patients. And they actually appreciate not having to get their care, you know, family care, whatever, and if we can visit with them. As long as we can get laboratories, and I hate to say that laboratories are very important, but they are, and, and from the standpoint of we can tell so much from them, um, you always want to see patients happy to interact with them and everything like that, want to shake hands with them. Well, we can't shake hands anymore, I guess. But the idea is that um, the laboratories really tell a lot of the secret, and so we can screen for when people do and don't need to see us it, it physically. But we're, we're almost to the point right now with you've been transplanted, you know, within the first 90 days, we bring people in. We tend to bring people in. But if you're beyond 90 days, we're probably at 80% of folks being seen virtually. They appreciate it, and you know, it's from their standpoint of their safety, and if they can get the blood work, I can manage people from, from here to Timbuktu. So the next question is, how do I get my insurance's IPA to approve me signing up to a different city for a kidney transplant? I tried doing that, and my insurance IPA would not approve it. Hmm. I'm, uh, I would have to, I could put you in touch with, with our, you know, our financial person. I, I um, uh, that's, you know, you can saw all those people on that list. It's a very specialized thing. I, I wish I could help you on that, but I'm sure there are more appropriate people for that. I, I, I'm sorry about that. Um, but um, that one I can't, I, I, I could not give you any great suggestions. We've had no particular problems depending on what things are, particularly, you know, Medicare covers a significant amount of, of end-stage real disease and, and transplant in the country. With Medicare, there's no issues uh, that I know of. And, and so I, I just, that's all I can say. Sorry, I, I, can't, I can't really answer. I, I feel for you because it's, it's, um, it, it does help people get transplanted. And the crazy part is, is if you get transplanted earlier, they don't have to pay for your dialysis. But it's, I, I'll get off my soapbox. Go ahead. <laughs> so the next question is, I'm a 73-year-old with PKD and a GFR hovering between 15 and 16 for two years. I have dilated uh, cardiomyopathy with EJ of 35 to 40. I'm on an active or inactive transplant list at Albany uh, Medical, and I'm not on dialysis. Should I go active? Uh, well, it depends why you are inactive. Because one person, well, a person doesn't get healthier the longer they wait. Um, I, I, you know, again, this is between you and your medical team, and I should be making medical recommendations. But I would, I would probably leave it at that and just suggest that you talk to your team and, and make sure that they um, understand your, your, your situation and what you wish to do. Because um, waiting longer, would, to me, doesn't make a lot of sense. If you're active on the list, you, 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 your goal is always to be active. And um, unless there's some reason that they have you inactive, that I, you know, multiple infections or, or tumor or something else that has to be resolved, I don't see why a person would be on the list inactive. That's my comment. 